This is Christianity 101, the podcast connecting busy people with Jesus. I'm your host, Rick Grundy. This is episode seven. This past week, I did something totally awesome with a guy from, from our church hillside, uh, Virgis. He and I went door to door, just knocking on, on uh, our neighbor's doors in a new neighborhood, new subdivision that's going up, and basically we're just saying, hey, uh, I'm your neighbor, and I go to a local church, and I noticed that you just moved in here too. We were all just moved in here. Uh, would you be interested in, in uh, checking out our local church? It was, it was awesome because it, was, it reminded me of the good old days. Yeah, I've got some good old days. Back when I, very early on when I became a Christian, I'm not really sure, like the first, maybe second year I became a Christian, uh, a guy in my church started up this outreach team that was going, we were basically going door to door, going to schools, going anywhere we could to share the gospel, and I joined that. And uh, I remember going door to door and talking to people. Just it brought me back to those good old days with with my friend going door to door, the guy who was leading the outreach team. And I just thought it I thought it was awesome. Uh, but you know what? Going door to door is is really great. And sharing sharing my faith that is really great. There is another side of door to door that I was exposed to um, at my at my previous church where I was a pastor. I've got a I've got a friend who owns a coffee shop a coffee shop just down the street from my last church, and she was uh, she was kind of checking out Christianity. She was checking out God. She wasn't really sure which way she was going to go, and uh, she decided that she wanted to try try on Jehovah's Witnesses, and so she went to one of their meetings and she said, "Rick, I got to tell you, I went into that meeting and I didn't quite understand what I was what I was looking at, but it was pure." sales pitch. They were, they were teaching us how to deliver a sales pitch, and then they were showing us how many points or, or how we earn st- our way into some kind of spiritual blessing to get to, to earn salvation. It was, it was just weird. Now, I'm not entirely sure how to understand what she was trying to tell me, but she did give me their schedule. And, and there was these meetings, these door-to-door meetings, fully training you how to, uh, how to speak to somebody at the door. And then there's a point system or something. I don't know. But, but that group of people in that Jehovah's Witness church that, that she went to, they were fully trying to earn their salvation. You know, you can't work for your salvation. You can't. Christianity isn't something that you work to get. However. And I say that word like it's three words. However. Once you're a Christian, there is some work to do. We can't work hard enough to get saved. But now that we are saved, okay, just let me ask, is staying a Christian harder than what we're putting into it? The theme over these last few episodes is, what's a Christian to do? I'm looking at what it takes to be a believer for an entire lifetime. What what do we have to do to be sure that, you know, that the prayer that we said, who knows how long ago... Jesus, please forgive me. Teach me to live as your friend. I believe in you. You know, that prayer, whatever it was that we said so long ago, however long ago, how do, how do we make sure that that prayer doesn't end there, but we continue a lifelong fellowship with Jesus that ends in glory? Like, how do, how do we be sure of that? Today, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Can I encourage you just to pause this for a second? Uh, click on the link in the show notes. It'll take you over to Bible Gateway where you can read Hebrews chapter 4, 1 to 11 yourself. Here is the point of this particular episode. Is Christianity harder than what you're putting into it? Yeah, you know, First, we, we've been spending a lot of time on the word if in this sermon of Hebrews. We, we've been talking about meeting the conditions. We've been discussing the reality that people can choose to walk away from Jesus. So I'd like to look at this a little bit more positively this time. You know, to answer that question, we really need the text to tell us, okay, well, what work is required for being a Christian? So let's get into the text and begin right at verse 1. First, two Christians, reading from chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, 
Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did, but the message that they heard was of no value to them because they didn't share the faith of those who obeyed. Now, we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, so I declare an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest." If, if Christianity requires something from believers, what is really required? And by the way, you know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense in a certain light, by the way. In a certain light, Hebrews looks contradictory if you, if you read it in a certain light. As a matter of fact, Hebrews was one of the last letters to be included in the New Testament. It, it didn't even make it into the first round of the New Testament books. James, Third John, and Revelation, those were problem books for people. James looked like it was a complete conflict of what, what it was that Paul was writing. Hebrews 2, nobody knew who the writer of Hebrews was. In Romans, we learn that we can't be good enough, that salvation has to be by grace. We also learn that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So seeing all of these if statements through Hebrews... It seems a little contradictory. In the text, we see another example of a group of people who were in a relationship with God. They were saved. And then God declares that they're no longer saved. Okay, so heads up, the text doesn't use the term saved, of course. It uses the term rest, which is the same thing. To have found God's rest is to have come into salvation. To be denied God's rest is to be denied salvation. So yeah, we really are talking about salvation. We need to take a moment to read a little more closely because it's starting to sound like our salvation hangs in the balance of our ability to live by a set of rules. I once knew a girl in an old youth group that I used to lead, and she was a part of a foster home. She was a really great girl. As a matter of fact, the youth group expanded from three kids to a hundred kids in just about two years because this girl was bringing so many friends to it, it just filled it up really, really quickly. I really appreciated her enthusiasm for youth, but I, I was brokenhearted by how she was being treated. She was in this foster home, and uh, only for a few months, the, the couple who, who had, the family who had brought her into their home uh, was a good couple. They um, they had her for a little while, and then a few months into it, they realized that it was not a good fit because she just simply couldn't live up to some of their standards, some of their some of their expectations. She was pushing past some of the boundaries that they wanted in place, and because she wasn't able to live up to their expectations, they went back to the society where she came from. Said, "I'm sorry." This one's not for us. You're going to have to send her away. When she first got to their house, they were all loving and caring and and embracing. And then a little bit later, no more loving, no more caring, no more embracing. Well, they still liked her, but no, she is not for us. Send her away. And then she landed in another home. And thankfully, um, my wife and I uh, became friends with the the couple who who brought her into their home. And she continued to attend the youth group. And again, she was embraced and she was loved and she was accepted. And then... She wasn't able to meet the expectations of them, too, although they had quite a bit longer um, experience with her still. They were, they, she reached a point where she kind of ran out of, out of love, so to speak. Is, is that what we have with God? Are we like foster kids who are granted a relationship as a gift just to find out that there are a ton of unattainable expectations on the other side? I'm setting it up like this because I know that not everybody... Uh, agrees with me that you can lose your salvation. I get that. And and I'm recognizing that I see some conflicts here, and I see some of the problems that we have with the text. I'm not going to water down this text at all, but I am going to try to bring some clarity to it. Today, I want all of us believers to be absolutely certain we know that we are connected with God. Or, if there's a problem, I want us to know what we can do about it to fix it in a hurry. So there's two questions that I want to give to you believers to bring clarity to this passage and to your connection with Jesus. Here's the first question. Does your belief affect your heart? Does your belief affect your heart? Really, really strange question, but look at at the verse here. It says, fallen short. We've seen this last week. 
the pastor who's writing Hebrews here, he's referencing the Jews in the Old Testament to show his congregation what went wrong. And here's the picture being painted. Israel was in relationship with God, which means they were saved. Okay? They were heading, heading for God's rest. Had they stayed connected with him, they would have completely come into the promised land. They were in relationship with God. But Israel was rejected and no longer saved. They were no longer invited into God's rest. What happened? The pastor loves his church. The pastor of Hebrews, he loves his church. And he wants to be very, very clear. Exactly how did Israel fall short? Well, here are two telling parts of the story here. The verse says, one of the verses says, the message they heard was of no value to them. And here's another verse. They did not share the faith. The first generation of freed Israelites didn't value their relationship with God. Can you imagine it? When when thinking about their connection with God, when thinking about their relationship with God, it was of no value to them. The first generation of freed Israelites were not doing what the other believers who did value their relationship with God were doing. Other believers who were accepted, they valued God and stayed in the relationship with him. So listen, to make it really, really clear, I'm not watering it down. I'm trying to make it really clear so that we can see the application here. Their belief never touched their heart. Here's the big, the big idea here. The relationship was never healthy. I had a music leader once in an old church that I used to lead, and I remember one, one board meeting, he came into church and he swore at me. And I remember that the relationship could never get healthy with that guy because he had a predisposition to not like me. And I kind of got it. He, he didn't want me. He wanted his former senior pastor. I get that. So the relationship was already hard to begin with. But there was no growing that relationship because it was unhealthy and there was no desire to get it healthy. He treated me like a competitor instead of like a partner. Now, now here's the key with this relationship here. The relationship with the Old Testament uh, Israel was never healthy. People can be in a relationship with God, but that relationship can be and can become unhealthy. Now, doesn't that make sense? Aren't you in a number of unhealthy relationships? Don't we understand what it is to have family relationship problems, spouse problems, neighbor problems, boss problems, coworker problems? problems with an ex, perhaps. We're in a relationship with all those people, but the relationship is unhealthy. I think we understand that relationships can be or can become unhealthy. You know, I, I read through the Old Testament. No, I read through the Bible in about five months, and I'm doing it again. I'm starting to go through the Old Testament again, and it's. I'm not, I'm not going for depth here, I am just going for survey. I just want to make sure that I I get the story of the Bible back in my head so it's still fresh. It's really easy to spot the relationship problems when reading through the Old Testament quickly, because they come at me like a sucker punch to the gut. I'm left feeling like, wow, how could anyone treat God like that? And of course, when I slow down, I suddenly realize, oh, wait a minute, I can treat God like that. Oh, I get it. That that first generation of freed Israelites, they didn't respect God. They thought the very worst of God most often. They never gave God the benefit of the doubt. They never trusted him. Out in the middle of a desert, God freed them from slavery. He, he led them through uh, a sea on dry ground and collapsed it behind them and stopped an army. They're in the middle of the desert. They say, oh, God just brought us out here to kill us. Always thinking the worst of him. Never go and say, hey, by the way, we're thirsty. Can you please give us some water? Never, never thinking the best of him. Always thinking the very worst of God. It was an unhealthy relationship that they didn't care to fix. Please don't let that ever happen to you. If you ever happen to have a revelation that you're wrong or out of touch with God, please fix it right away. Please keep short accounts with God. He'll love you right back into a healthy relationship really well. As long as you don't keep rejecting him, he will love you right back in that relationship. But if that relationship you've got with with God ever turns unhealthy, do what you can to make it healthy. Don't keep don't don't begrudge God. Don't make God out to be the bad guy. You know, go back and, and reconcile with him and get that relationship help, relationship healthy again. Now here's the big deal behind the passage, and also here's the second question. Has your belief 
become a growing relationship. Because if your belief is not a growing relationship, then your belief isn't isn't of much value to you. It's leading towards an unhealthy relationship. The text has no value. Remember, God doesn't offer us a religion. Okay, it, what you believe in is is absolutely important. God is not offering us a religion. He only offers us a relationship that's based on faith. The text has no value. The message they heard was of no value. Now I get this phrase. I really do of no value and it absolutely breaks my heart when i was out um when i was out door to door with uh with barry geese one of my new friends from uh from our church i noticed as, as i'm knocking on doors i noticed that about one in every 10 houses was a seeker and i think that's just because the neighborhood that i live in um about eight of the houses that I would knock on, they were connected to a church somehow, some kind of church background, and not you know, denominationally wide. You know, there were some Baptists, some Pentecostals, some non-denominational, some Catholic, denominational wide. Uh, there was one that had nothing, and there was one that was a seeker, and that was that was just that one evening that I went out. Those were the stats for for that one street, that one neighborhood I went through. Now I've shared the gospel with people who don't value the message. I have. And yes, there are some non-believers who don't value the gospel. There are. But mostly, the responses I get that qualify as not valuing the message are from people who have some kind of churchy background. So eight of the ten houses that we knocked on that had some kind of churchy background, that's where most of the negativity was coming from. People without a church background, they have no idea if they value the message or not because they're not familiar with the message. But the people who knew about God... They were exposed to God, maybe they grew up in the church, and now they find that it has absolutely no value to them. And, and I wish this were only true of that first generation of Jews who were free from sla- slavery. It can be true of a ton of people today. When people don't value Jesus, there is either an unhealthy relationship or there's no relationship. We are in a relationship with Jesus because of our faith. We stay in a relationship with Jesus because we keep valuing him. So here's the danger the pastor's warning about. When Jesus is undervalued, when something else is valued above Jesus, we are in danger of walking away from him. But when we continue to value Jesus, when we continue to assess our core values and keep Jesus at the center, then there is no danger. Here's the work required. Here is, believers, listen to this, here is the work required for you and I to stay in a healthy relationship with Jesus. Value your relationship with Him. That's the work required. Just like you value your friend, just like you value your spouse, just like you value your kids. Value Jesus. What's the work required? And are we putting enough effort into Christianity? Well, you tell me. Is Jesus most valuable to you? Does your value of Jesus influence your schedule? Does it influence the time you spend with friends? Does it influence your social behavior? Does it influence your daily routine? Does it influence your Facebook posts and what you choose to like? Do you value Jesus so much that he's the first thing on your schedule each day? Do you value him so much that you're very quick to talk about him with others? You can be absolutely confident that you're doing the work required as a believer when you treat Jesus like he's your best friend, your Lord, your most prized possession. Which means when you ask Jesus, how can I grow my friendship with you? Or how can I serve you better? You can absolutely know the answer to that. If you in any way are putting something ahead of Jesus or allowing yourself to be influenced by something not biblical, then you know what you need to do about it. So the application is this. Treat Jesus like he's your best friend and Lord. I mean, Jesus says it best in, in Luke ten twenty seven: Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. How do you know that you're on track? You love him and you keep it relational with him. So let me ask you, how you doing? Is Christianity harder than what you're putting into it? Are you putting the work of relationship building into it? Are you valuing him so much that he's your first relationship? Okay, so clearly this isn't rock and science. I'm keeping it very, very... I'm not even going basic here. I'm just keeping it clear. Not rocket science. The text has just become clear. I didn't water it down. I brought clarity to it. It's, it's a simple matter of relationship, as it always is, just like in the whole rest of the New Testament. So that was for believers. This part is for you if you still have not decided to choose Jesus. This is, so I'm going to call you a seeker. I'm sorry if you're offended by that. It's just a 
word that tends to be used uh, for people who are maybe you looking around saying, okay, maybe I might be interested in Jesus, and what's what's the deal about? So here we go. This is for you. Chapter 4, starting at verse 7. God again set a certain day, calling it today. Love that phrase. I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, this he did when a long time uh, later he spoke through David, as in the past I recorded, today, fear his voice. Don't harden your hearts. For anyone who enters God's rest, talking about salvation here, also rest from their work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every enter, every effort, enter that rest, so that uh, no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. Listen, that is a mouthful. There is a ton of information there, and there's lots of stuff you need context for, so I'm just going to bring a little bit of clarity here. You know, I like that word today, because we use it. We use it. I mean, we don't use the word today. We use a different word, but it's a modern-day proverb. Don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. That, that's what this is saying. The pastor of Hebrews is asking us not to procrastinate. Jesus is real. He offers a real relationship and, and all eternity. What he offers is far more than what you and I could ever give. You, know, you heard me talk to the Christians if you didn't skip ahead. He's looking for a friendship that will last your whole life then he's going to reward you with glory. Now, you have a choice. Can I encourage you to choose Jesus soon? Secondly, you will be given a gift. The text says rest, and I've said that rest means, means salvation. This word rest is trickier than the word today. The word today is easy. The word rest, we don't really use this word like it's used here. I mean, the word rest speaks of the fulfillment of everything that you might be looking for. Um, I like a I like a quote that I recently heard uh, Jim Carrey say. Jim Carrey, yeah, that actor from TV. He says, "I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of, so they can see that it's not the answer." If you're looking for rest, then searching in this world is not where you're going to find it. Uh, this guy named King Solomon from the Old Testament. Here's here's what he says: Everything's meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors? Generations come, generations go. The sun rises, the sun sets, the wind blows uh, south and turns north. Round and round it goes. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. The eye never has enough of seeing. What is uh, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered. Rest is a word that means all that searching is over, and you've found what you're looking for. Gift can be called forgiveness, salvation, heaven, rest, friendship. It can also be called a restart, a clean start, or a do-over if that's what you need in life. If you choose to believe in Jesus, thirdly here, you will have a new friend. The text says every effort to avoid their example. Make every effort to avoid their example. The words to avoid aren't in there, they're implied. Make every effort to avoid their example. Your choice is to believe in Jesus. That's the every effort part. If you haven't done that yet, put some more time and effort into the discussion because it's a really big deal. Now, talking about avoiding their example, there are a few examples around you of people who choose not to believe in Jesus. Reject those examples. They're not getting any better. They're not going to get any better. Reject those examples. When you choose Jesus, he calls you a child of God and a friend. You get a restart in life, glory in eternity, and you become a friend of God forever. Now, here's the work required for you. Choose the friendship being offered. That's the work required of you. Choose the friendship being offered. And you do that by placing your faith in Jesus. Please choose Jesus. Let me wrap it up in one minute just by answering the question in summary form. Is Christianity harder than what you are putting into it? Well, in summary fashion, let's see. God requires something better than a casual engagement. God requires you to value the friendship. So capture this moment and every moment after and treat God like he's valuable to you. Here's one last phrase, just two words for you to take away with you to summarize this entire passage, this entire episode, rather, with just two words, memorable, so you can take it with you and say, yeah, that's what this episode was about. Here's what I'm calling you to do. Would you please do this? Here's the two words that I want you to take, take away with you. Here it is. Value Jesus. 
That's it for today's episode. Thanks for hanging in till the very end. Looking forward to Wednesday when another episode comes out. God bless you. See you then. <laughs>